may be wondering if you're paying attention to where the gospel came from of why it's coming from Luke and not from Mark. See, we're in year B of the liturgical cycle. There's year A, B, and C, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the reason it's not from Mark is because Mark doesn't have really any part of the nativity story in it. And so the church in its infinite wisdom uh, chooses Luke even in year B uh, for these readings sometimes during Advent, of course, especially when it comes to the nativity scene. And so we hear this gospel today and one that we're very familiar with, uh, so much so that sometimes because we've heard it so often, we may, may, not saying you did, but you may have tuned out just a little bit. I don't know if you did or didn't. I know that even sometimes when I read the gospel, I tune out. But hey, that's me, not you. I'm sure you all paid attention to it 100%. But just in case you didn't, just in case, I want to go over it a little bit more today and actually have you listen to it, certain parts, not the whole thing, but put yourself there as a first century Jew. Because then all of a sudden, oh, this reading, it knocks your socks off. That's what it does. You'd be, if you heard this reading, you would be so excited. You would just, you would be like, whoa. It'd be like uh, Buddy the Elf, right? When, he, when they, you know, Santa, I know him, but a hundred times more. That's what it would be like if you heard this reading, because you'd be so excited because something amazing has happened here. What has happened is a fulfillment of this long-awaited promise, this long-awaited fulfillment of this covenant that we actually heard about in our first reading today from 2 Samuel. Before we get to the first reading, let's go back to the gospel. It's important to note that we have Joseph. And it states that Joseph is what? Well, Mary is betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. This is extremely important because Joseph is a part of David's line. Now, who is David? Well, of course, we know David is, is the greatest king, uh, up to, of course, till Jesus, that the Israelites have ever had. Better than Saul, better than even Solomon. He is the king of kings. And we know that from his line, which we're going to hear about in, this, in the first reading, an heir is going to come. And so everyone's always waiting for this from, from David's line. But what happens, we know, is that, well, eventually, especially the Babylonian exile, the Israelites are spread across the whole world. And yet people would still realize that Joseph, he's part of David's line. But he's not really that much royalty because we hear later in the presentation that when they present Jesus in the temple, both Joseph and Mary are known to be kind of as poor. All they can afford is two turtle doves. They can't afford uh, to have that, that real sacrificial uh, uh, lamb. Instead, it's, it's just that, that offering that poor people would make. But even then, people would say, Joseph is part of the line of David. And so when Gabriel appears to Mary, and this is usually what we focus on in this gospel, when Gabriel appears to, to Mary, behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you should name him Jesus. That's kind of what we focus on. But it's important to see what Gabriel says next, because he describes who Jesus is going to be. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So more, four main things that Jesus is going to be. He's going to be great He's going to be the throne of David. He's going to be son of the Most High. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And as soon as Mary heard this, or as soon as anyone would have read this in scriptures in the first century, they would have gone back to the first reading we had today and saying, it's happening. Our Savior is here. They wouldn't have to look at any of the miracles of Jesus. They would have seen this is the fulfillment of, of the promise of what was going to happen. And they would have been so ecstatic. This, this, this joy would have overwhelmed them. They would have gone out and told everyone because what they heard from 2 Kings, 2 Samuel, I mean. And of course, this is where David now has set up the house of Israel. He set up this, this kingdom. There's no more war for the most part. There's no more strife. It's, it's known as this, 
this great kingdom. Remember, this is the exodus into Israel. This is the promised land. This is what David has been able to finally have, that fulfillment. No more war, no more strife. He's taken down the Philistines. His kingdom, it's good to go. And I know that's not words they used back then, right? But this is what it is. It's, it's finally there. And so he says, I'm going to go ahead and set up a house for the Lord, for the Ark of the Covenant. And Nathan's like, yeah, go ahead. But then the Lord appears to Nathan, the prophet, and says, no, 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 don't have David do this. Someone else can set up that house. Of course, that's going to be Solomon. But not only that, in this prophecy, Nathan goes on to say this. The Lord also reveals to you that he will establish a house for you. And when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your heir after you, sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall stand firm forever forever. So David knows that this line is going to come from him. He knows that this person who's coming is going to be great. It's going to come from the throne of David. It's going to be son of the Most High, and of his kingdom there'll be no end. And so when Gabriel says this to Mary, this fulfillment is happening. But what happened between David and the time of Jesus? Of course, we know shortly after uh, David passed away, and, and Solomon as well, we had the splitting of the tribe of Israel with the ten northern tribes and we had the two southern tribes. And then we had the Babylonian exile. When this happened, Israel was scattered far apart across the whole world. And they were kind of, their religion, in a certain sense for a while there, was hanging on by a thread. They were not a great kingdom. It didn't seem like they were going to last forever, there was no yet son of the most high. And so when Gabriel appears to Mary, what does Israel look like then? Well, not only is scattered far apart, but essentially they have a foreign ruler over them. They have Caesar. And Caesar's appointed this puppet king, Herod, who's not of the line of David, by the way. He's kind of half a Jew, half not. He's from a different line. And so they're waiting and they're, they're praying. And a lot of people probably would have given up hope. It's never going to happen. And so when Gabriel appears to Mary and says this, this great joy comes. This great excitement comes. And as people would have heard about this, especially reading in the scriptures of this, they all would have connected the dots and said, we finally have this kingdom, which is established forever. And they realized, by the way, as well, not so much an earthly kingdom, but an eternal kingdom with God. Because this is what Jesus did. He set up not an earthly kingdom that's going to crumble, but an eternal kingdom with God. Of course, we know 70 years after Jesus, we have the destruction of, of the temple. But what has God set up? Well, he set up this, this new church, part of this, this new covenant in which he's always going to take care of us. And that's why we celebrate Christmas. It's not just, yeah, some baby was born. I mean, please don't ever think about that as Jesus, right? Some baby is born in Bethlehem, right? It's, it's not so much about, you know, uh, songs either. It's not so much about, you know, it's definitely not about Santa Claus, what Christmas is about is a celebration that our Savior is here and that we have a kingdom that is going to endure forever. And it just looks, as we can see as well, we know it's from that line of David. It's the fulfillment of this covenant. And once again, a first century Jew realizing this, whew, they would be so excited it's finally happening. No more torment. No more destruction. Nor we're being fled to the outskirts of the world. 
We have our Lord. We have our Savior. And it would overfill them with joy the same way it should overfill us with joy as well. Even in the midst of suffering. To know that we have this eternal kingdom that God has set up for us. Our psalm speaks of this today as well. Psalm 89. Of course, that, that beautiful antiphon. And that word forever is in there again. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. The promises of the Lord I will sing forever through all generations. My mouth shall proclaim your faithfulness. For you have said, my kindness is established forever. In heaven you have confirmed your faithfulness. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to who? To David, my servant. Forever I will confirm your posterity and establish your throne for all generations. He shall say of me, you are my father, my God, the rock, my savior. Forever I will maintain my kindness toward him and my covenant with him stands firm. And in Jesus Christ, this is happening. All of the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. All of the prophecies are fulfilled in him. It's right there. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is going to endure forever, even in the midst of suffering even in the midst of destruction, even in the midst of pandemics, even in the midst of sorrow, even in the midst of earthly death, God is still present and his kingdom endures forever, eternally. And we have to remember this and we have to celebrate this. We must let this joy overwhelm us. That's how we can say, Merry Christmas. Not because of the gifts we receive and material things. Merry Christmas because we have a Savior who has come into this earth for us and truly will do anything for us forever. And what we must do is praise him forever and acknowledge his love that he has for us forever. In good times, in bad times, in challenging times, to continue to thank the Lord and to praise him. You know, back when I was in uh, high school and college, I really started taking my faith a little more seriously, a little more personal. I started praying on my own, and, and I thought the biggest change for me probably in my, my faith was when I, I changed the radio station from 93X to KTIS. That was a big change, right? No longer am I listening to Metallica. I'm listening to, you know, better music than that. Because I realized when I listen to this religious music, you know, on KTIS or other CDs that I, that I had, that I actually felt better as well. And I could praise the Lord. And so sure enough, I started doing that. I started being involved a little more in praise and worship music as well during adoration. Um, and just really meant those songs meant a lot to me. And actually, it was at my, uh, my father's funeral uh, that we decided to add one of, those, one of those songs. And that song, at first, maybe it doesn't make sense to have at a funeral. But that song is, uh, I could sing of your love forever. And the reason we had that song at, at my dad's funeral is because even in the midst of, of suffering, even in the midst of affliction, even in the midst of death, we could see God's love present, that he was with us, and that God was going to take care of him, was going to take care of all of us. And so I want to finish my homily by, by trying to sing that song today. But as I do that, I just, I just ask you to, to think of things that you can be grateful for. And think how God truly is present in your life. And just be thankful to him that he's a savior who has set up a kingdom for us that's going to last forever. Forever with him. 
Over the mountains in the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Oh, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. But when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. I will sing of your love forever. 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 I will sing of your love forever.